Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. You'll notice the new camera angle here. Yes, I did buy some removable camera mounts for my camera so I could mount it over my bench much more easily than before. Before, I think I complained about it on a previous video, it required unscrewing and screwing the camera in. So now I can just simply clip the camera in to both the tripod and the mount over my bench. It's fantastic and thank you to all the viewers who suggested the mount I buy, Manfrotto or something like that. I don't know how to pronounce the name. I bought them from Amazon, that's all I can say. Anyhow, it is Wednesday, so we all know what that means. It's time for another midweek mini mail call. And this is number 31, I think. And what's cool is all the packages that I'm gonna be opening on mail call from now on, I think are things that I actually, well, I opened them in 2021. I didn't receive them all in 2021. I had been receiving them even before. This was stuff that you saw under the Christmas tree in some of my more recent videos, but I've actually opened everything up. So now I'm gonna be slowly working through all, all those packages. There are still a few things that I need to get to that I opened last year that I wanna make proper videos about it. I know I have said this so many times, so I apologize for not getting to those yet, but I will. In addition, I do have to apologize that the first couple things I opened in 2021, I had the camera, the Sony camera here, on manual focus mode. So it turns out that I had shot the stuff behind me there where I'm unboxing and they were out of focus. And there's unfortunately not much I can do about that because I've already opened it and got rid of the packaging. So I can't reshoot those sections. So they are out of focus and I apologize for that. But it, I think in this upcoming video, it's only gonna be one of the segments that the unboxing is out of focus. But there may be one more of those in future upcoming mail calls. So again, I apologize for that. And don't worry, it's not everything that I've opened in this um, unboxing session. It was just a couple of the things. Anyhow, I've done enough talking so Let's get right to it. All right, we have a package here and it comes from YouTube fan in Willard, Ohio. Uh, as you can see, this is a HP monitor box here. I'm just peering over the size of it here. I don't think it's actually an HP monitor in here. I can feel soft packing material through the opening on the side here. So this is just a reuse of a box. Let me tear into it, see exactly what it is. Uh, we have a letter here, so let's put that aside for now. And opening it up here, it is definitely a Pizza Box Mac. Looks like we have a Mac LC2 computer here. The Macintosh LC series, that stands for low cost and two as in the second iteration of this, there was a LC, LC2, and I think an LC3. Um, I never thought very highly of these computers because they were quite crippled from Apple. Um, in fact, I think I've talked about this with the Macintosh Classic a little bit. The Classic 2, that is, um, was a crippled machine with the data bus and other issues. And the motherboard in this machine is extremely similar to, um, to that computer. So it has very similar bottlenecks and whatnot on it. But uh, yeah, looking inside the computer here, there it is, looks rather complete. We have no battery leakage, which is a good thing. Let's take a look at the note here. It comes from Ed in Ohio. He says, great job on all the content you provide on your channel. Please accept this Mac LC2. Unfortunately, the machine does not work correctly. It also has a missing floppy drive and hard drive. And I see that, but uh, it's nice. The hard drive bracket, which I think is this here, is installed because when that's missing, it's kind of hard to get a hard drive in here. Floppy drive, on the other hand, I think I have floppy drives that have the right bracket on them and it just clips in place, I think. The board inside is from a Performa 460, I believe. The board displays nothing on screen when powered on. I did confirm it receives power. In a last ditch effort, I washed it, hot soap and water, dried it thoroughly, no luck. Hope you can revive it. Also note the power supply does not work either. More likely it needs caps. 
This is something I know you can easily handle. Good luck and I hope you can make it all work again. It would be a good machine to test logic boards of similar design along with other early 90s Mac components. As always, keep providing the great content, Ed. Thank you very much, Ed. Yeah, it's interesting actually. So there was a mail call episode a little while ago where I received a power supply adapter for these machines, if I recall, that lets me use a standard ATX power supply, like a Pico ATX. So I haven't been able to test that because I never had a machine. So this would be a good machine to test with. But yes, yeah, so unfortunately the design looks different enough that I can't just use, for instance, like a classic two motherboard in here or whatnot. Obviously that doesn't support color anyway. So of course that's not gonna work. But yeah, okay, well, uh, let's just take a closer look at this on the bench. All right, the Mac LC2 from Ed. Let's crack this open, take a look inside. I put the note that Ed sent just in case uh, I would forget it or something. Sometimes it's hard to keep track of the items I get from mail call and the notes I get. So putting it inside, that works. All right, so where to begin? Um, unfortunately, I am out of capacitors again. So I cannot recap this uh, board because uh, I don't have the caps. Now, Ed had mentioned in his letter that this power supply was bad. So I'm just gonna pop it out. There's little plastic clips. Let's see if I can figure out how to do this without breaking anything. There we go, that, that just lifts out, made by TDK. Well, I don't see any evidence of leaking caps. There's no goop or anything on the case or the bottom of the power supply. That doesn't mean it hasn't leaked inside and might be why there are issues. So taking a closer look at this motherboard here, it's a Motorola 68030 at 33 megahertz. And it actually looks to be in pretty good shape just from quick appearances. Now, Ed had mentioned he had washed it, but it still didn't work. But that could just be the power supply that's causing an issue. And he said it was a Performa, what does he say in his letter? He said Performa 460. I'm not exactly sure what the differences are there. And I think as I mentioned before, and other videos, I'm just not super expert when it comes to different Macintoshes, um, all the various permutations that they had. Now I've zoomed up and like take a look right here. This cap here has definitely caused a lot of crust on the motherboard. Like the contacts around the cap are a mess and there's this sort of crustiness right here along the side of this chip here, which is probably the SCSI controller. And these ICs here also are corroded. This would be the area that handles the sound because these are the sound output devices and they are looking not super great either. Not terrible though, but not great. So because this power supply doesn't seem to be working, this might be a good time to test this replacement power supply that I was sent in for a mail call episode. And I'm pretty sure this is for this machine. So this little back plate here would go right here, something like that. And this connector here, I guess, should just plug straight into the motherboard. Now, I only have one working Pico ATX and it's inside my PC Junior, so I don't have access to that right now, but I can just use a regular ATX power supply with this and we, you know, it'll have to run outside the machine, but that should work. And here's what I'm gonna try. It's an Amtec True Power 2.0, 380 watts, or I'm sorry, 480 watts. I don't know, it's just a random ATX power supply that I had sitting around. So this will be perfect. Look at all these cables and stuff, all unnecessary. This is all we really need. So I'm just gonna plug this in. Oh, it uses the extra connector here. Okay, so ATX standard later came with more pins. So you can uh, add the, the connector together to add those extra pins. This goes on like this. I'm sure it doesn't really use those, but we'll just lay this off to the side there, like so. I plugged in the power supply. And what I'm really trying to do here is just see if there's any kind of signs of life with this motherboard. I can plug my monitor in in a second, but let's just see if turning the power switch on actually makes this thing come to life and the fan should spin. I'll plug a monitor in. I don't expect to hear any sound. Here's the speaker just kind of flopping around for whatever reason, I guess the the clips that hold it in are, oh yeah, that's this is broken. That is why that flops around. I'm gonna use my little Mac monitor adapter here and I don't even think this has a, a setting for the 512 resolution that these originally used. So it's gonna have to try to run at 640 by 480. Let's just make sure it's set that way. 640 by 480, which is one and two are on. And one and two are on, so that's how that's configured. Luckily, the Acer monitor I have on my bench here is very, very compatible with pretty much everything because it specifically supports sync on green, which is needed for a lot of these older Macintoshes like the Mac 2 CI. If your monitor doesn't support sync on green, even with an adapter like this, 
I don't think it works. So it, this LCD, I know to be very compatible. And power this on. Hey, I have, oh no, no signal. <laughs> I saw the blue light, I thought it's working, but that was just the, the on-screen displays. Okay, so this did not come to life. Now the question is, does it need video RAM installed in this socket here? Obviously there's regular system RAM. I can try taking that out. That could be preventing this computer from booting. So we'll remove this memory module. I have what it says Mac VRAM on the back here. So let's see if this is even compatible. I don't know if this is a ROM socket. No, this is definitely a video RAM socket that goes in there. So let's see now if this thing turns on. I have to reconnect the power supply and we'll turn this on again. Whoa. So, um, all right, well, I think I just figured out what the problem is. These ROM chips are burning hot, like burning. And I have a feeling what happened here is that these are installed incorrectly. Now what's confusing, wow, those are really hot. There are one extra set of pins on these sockets and I think the ROM chips actually should have been installed like that, not all the way in, which means that these are probably damaged now. I would imagine they are dead. That actually might've been why this power supply appeared dead because these chips were shorting out and this was just protecting itself. And because I'm using a, a 400 watt power supply on this thing now, it will just burn anything that's, that's shorting. That's the one danger of using ATX power supplies. Um, they're not gonna protect the machine if it shorts out. And I just found a picture of the Performa 460 motherboard and it definitely looks like this motherboard. See how they are installed that way in the socket? And unfortunately, Ed, maybe when he cleaned the machine or might've been like that already, these chips were installed to the right. And I would imagine that those chips are now deceased. One thing that's cool about the Performa 460 though, is it is the equivalent of the LC3 Plus. So even though this is an LC2, I think this motherboard is actually a pretty good upgrade for it with 32-bit data path to the CPU, I think. It's not particularly clear on this side at least, but if that's the case, this will actually be a lot faster of a machine than the original LC2 motherboard. But I guess the question is, is I need to find replacement ROM chips uh, here to even attempt to try and get this thing working. I think just for fun, I'm gonna try these in here in the right spot. I'm sure they're dead, but let's just see. Now I'm not sure, I might have to swap these around. At least they're not burning hot now. <laughs> now, of course, this motherboard might have faults that are unrelated to the chips, like, and the capacitors themselves could cause a no boot condition. Or there might be something else that's wrong as well. Uh, it's definitely not doing anything there, but those chips are not hot anymore. That's a good sign. I'll just swap those around into the opposite sockets and turn it back on. Unfortunately, I, I know I have footage of this machine when I first opened it, but I didn't take any pictures. There is a little mark on this chip here, and I can't remember if that was in the top or the bottom socket. Yeah, this machine doesn't appear to be doing anything at all. Let's just check for any other hot chips on here. Everything else is running fine. I did also look at a different article just now in between shots here, and I noticed that this does not require this memory module be installed. I think this is the video RAM built in the motherboard. It's got like 512K. So um, you put this in there, it just probably allows higher resolution or higher color. All right, so I think these ROM chips are toast. Now the one thing is I have replacement ROM chips for the Amiga, which are these EEPROMs here, and they are the same number of pins but because we don't have schematics from Apple and these are mask ROMs, these are not just normal EEPROMs, I have no idea what the pinout of these are. Yeah, I have no idea if this ROM is compatible <laughs> with what's on the motherboard. I mean, obviously this works on an Amiga 500, it works on the Amiga 2000, stuff like that. That's why I bought these. So I bought these from China and they were marked with AMD part numbers 27C400, but that's fake and I rubbed off the paint and underneath it was actually a Mitsubishi 27400AK-12. That's what these chips really are, which are good. It's, these are good EEPROMs um, and they work really well on the Amiga. So I can program these. So if someone can tell me that these are the right ones that work in this Mac and someone points me to a copy of these ROMs, I can flash new copies um, and maybe get this computer working. But I think up until that point, 
I'm not gonna have any luck getting this particular computer up and booted. One more thing to try is let's just try this original power supply again. And we will see if it's coming to life now. I mean, I didn't even try it originally. I just took Ed's word for it that it was bad. But um, like I said, I'm pretty sure that it was just protecting the motherboard because of those chips. And I'll grab the multimeter here so we can just quickly check the voltage rails once this thing does power up. These look like the ground pins. There we go, ground. Oh, funny, I was just about to try to probe the wires and that one just broke right out of there. So that's one of the ground leads. Check the other ones. They seem fine. I mean, it probably would work with one ground, but certainly not ideal. I'm just gonna leave that in there. <laughs> and here we go, let's try it. Okay, actually, no, it's not even starting up. Let's just push this wire in here. Maybe it needs that. Nope, I hear it clicking inside. If we unplug the power supply and turn it on, let's see. I still hear it clicking. Okay, so yeah, this power supply, definitely not working. Let me just give this thing a quick inspection inside. This probably needs a new capacitor on the little reservoir for the switching controller that's in these things. It's most likely what's wrong here. If that doesn't have enough capacitance, what happens is it tries to start and um, to run the power supply, there has to be enough capacitance in that little capacitor that's for the controller. If there's not, it's very typical. You just sort of get the click, click, click starting. You know, won't start properly. Uh -huh. Plastic cover. Oh yes, everyone. This right here, that is damage from leaking capacitor right there. The trace is starting to get eaten away. So on the other side, and this is the low voltage side. So it's actually probably one of the main um, output filter caps that's leaking actually. But yeah, some damage there. Let's see if we can pop this out. All right, so yes, absolutely there's leaking going on. Um, right here, um, the board is kind of got this brown coating on it. It's sticky. It's all around, around here. So one of these caps, it's probably this one right here has actually been leaking. So that might have caused some kind of damage. That's probably not necessarily gonna cause this not to start, though it's possible. This small capacitor right here, this is the one that's running the switching uh, power supply controller here, this IC. If this one goes bad, this power supply definitely will not work. And I still suspect that this one is probably bad, although not necessarily. A lot of times the way the design is, this is really close to something that gets very hot and just dries it out. So you just need to swap it out. But it's actually kind of a spacious, you know, quote unquote spacious power supply. But yeah, there's definitely some leakage on this side here, which has leaked and caused that this trace to start getting eaten. I do kind of like the design of this thing. It has this plastic piece here that when the this power supply goes into there, this creates isolation between the various components, sort of holds things in place, just to make sure there's no chance of stuff banging into each other in here, which is kind of neat. I like that actually. Also, in case anyone is curious, here's the multimeter. Let's just check the main cap here. Check out if any voltages exist on here. No, so it's got 0.8 volts. There's a bleed resistor. It's probably that one right there that bleeds this down uh, to make sure that, you know, to avoid potential shocks happening. It happens pretty quickly. I, I, this thing hasn't been turned off very long. Not all power supplies have that bleed resistor though. Sometimes they fail and if they do and you touch that, you can get zapped. I am just going to pull out this start capacitor here. Let's just get this out of here. Come on, come out, come out. Stop fighting. There we go. And I'm just gonna pop out the capacitor here that I think is the leaky one, maybe. Yep. Check that out. Shiny and leaky and gross. It's an Elma. The rest are Nichicon. <laughs> there is a, that was a one-off. Oh, there's another Elma. I bet you both the Elmas are leaking. Let's pull that one off too. Yep, and that Elna appears to be leaking as well. So these are both 270 microfarad, 25 volt Elnas. I'm just gonna take this over to the sink and give it a quick alcohol clean on the leaky side here. And then I'll see if I can find some spare caps to pop in here to maybe get this thing booted up. We'll see if I can even make this thing turn on, we'll see. I found that when there's sort of corrosion on the traces here, it's good to just scratch off the solder mask and try to remove it. 
as much as possible. And then I'm going to just, you either apply some fresh solder on top of there, or maybe some new solder mask if you have some, or I'm just gonna use some lacquer, which is like <laughs> clear nail polish basically. And that should do the trick. You just don't wanna leave this exposed because the copper will continue to corrode. Wow, this really has eaten away at the copper there. So I'm just sort of scratching down into it. I might just try to apply some flux on top of this and then uh, put some fresh solder on top of this. Just kind of reinforce it, so to speak. Gonna try to heat this and add some fresh solder onto this. Of course, there's flux in the solder itself. So when you melt it, it's not adhering perfectly well, and that's because of the corrosion that's on there, but there we go. So the original cap was 8.2 volts at 50. I was able to find a 6.8, and I was able to find this, which is a bit larger. I think it's 33 at 50 volts. Yep, 33 at 50. So um, I'm gonna go for the 33 at 50 because it should be larger. I think the side effect of a larger cap in that spot, it means this thing might take longer to turn on because it needs to charge that cap up first off of a resistor off the mains input voltage. And once it gets to a high enough voltage, the switching, um, uh, switching controller starts, which then it runs the power supply for the switching controller, which is this IC here, off this low voltage side. So then that capacitor doesn't really come into play that much anymore. So um, anyways, I think it should still do the trick. So I'm just going to pop this in. All right, I've replaced all three caps for these two Elnas. I didn't find the exact 270s. I found 220s on an old monitor board or something in my spare parts bin. So I stuck those on here. They're, they're definitely lower profile. See, it's quite a bit shorter than these original ones. They're a little thicker though, but anyways, they're just newer, I guess. And Maybe that's why they're smaller. Anyhow, um, hopefully that's enough to kind of get this working. And I have that, um, what is this, 33 in here instead of 8.6. So I'm gonna try to power this thing up just as you see here. I've already spent a bit more time than I probably should have for a mail call. And let's plug this in here. Just make sure not to touch anything, obviously. Here we go. Okay, I hear it starting and it's doing the starting attempt. It's going more slowly than it was before, which probably has a lot to do with the larger cap there. So here's the Mac LC, and I'm going to try to plug this in like this. I'm gonna use a mouse pad to make sure it doesn't touch anything, and here we go. Yeah, unfortunately, it's still not running. I hear it clicking, you're not gonna hear it on camera, but it's trying to start up, click, click, click. And with the multimeter here, I bet you if I check for voltages, I might see a voltage pop up and disappear. Yeah, it's sort of doing that. So it's trying to start. There is a voltage adjustment pot here, and because it was all covered in leaky capacitor juice, I'm just gonna deoxid this and run it through its paces here. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. If that's out of whack, it's possible that the switching power supply controller is like, nope, these voltages are way too out of spec. So there we go, put it back to kind of where it was. No, I can still hear it clicking. No real changes on what we're getting on the output. Let me just turn this. Troubleshooting switching power supplies is not super hard once you sort of understand the fundamentals. It's just, without the schematics, it just takes a little bit of time to sort of reverse engineer the way this works. And really it's it's all about sort of checking all these components, all these resistor values. You know, you, you can see what they are by looking at them. And you just need to check that none of them are super high resistance because that, that definitely can happen with these power resistors here. There are diodes on the output side, those need to be working. One of those could be shorted, which could be why this thing won't start because it detects that short, and just fails right away. I don't think the switching transistor, which is right under here, is having a problem. Otherwise, it wouldn't even attempt to start. It would just probably blow the fuse immediately. So the problem probably exists over here or with the power supply for the switching IC. Or the switching IC is bad too, that's possible as well. Now, fortunately, because this machine has a motherboard that doesn't work seemingly anyways, and I have an alternate power supply, uh, troubleshooting this will take a bit more time than I have for mail call. So I'm thinking I'm gonna put everything back together here and I'm gonna need to move on to the next thing and put this aside. I'll put a note to say what I've already done on this. So when I get back to troubleshooting it in the future, I won't have to figure that out. 
So I think I'm ready to call it on this machine. It's back together for the most part. I'm gonna leave the power supply disconnected. I have my little notes here that talk about all the things I've done, like um, placing the caps, cleaning, what the original caps were, plus the two ROMs that are bad, 341, 0661, and 0662, and U19 and U24. So if someone can find those ROM images for the Performer 640 and send them to me, maybe I can get this thing kind of running. I'm gonna leave these two ROM chips out of here. Time to break out the dead parts bin. Yep, two more chips. I really need to expand this thing. It's completely overfilled with chips now. I can't really put the lid on anymore, unfortunately. So I did a little bit more research and I found out that the ROMs that are used on all of these machines here are the same pinout as these EEPROMs used in the Amiga. These chips are 512K at 8 bits or 256K at 16 bits because each of these are 16 bits wide. And it turns out that this motherboard, which is the Performa 460 motherboard, is the same as the LC3 Plus motherboard, which turns out is exactly the same as the LC3 motherboard with only a clock crystal being the difference. I think it's that and the uh, chip here, the processor runs at 33 versus 25. But otherwise, it's exactly the same. Same ROMs, same everything. And it turns out that there are Bowmark schematics for the LC3 motherboard, which of course is the same as this motherboard. And then that leads me to the fact that it has the pinouts for the ROM sockets, which indeed point to the fact that the EEPROMs that I have here for the Amiga are the same pinout as the original ROMs. These are the ones from the Color Classic, but they are the same chips, different code on here, which means if I find the ROMs online for the LC3, I can put them into these chips and have ROMs that work for this machine. Well, a little bit of searching has revealed that sure enough, there's a ROM collection of all the ROMs for the old Macintoshes on the internet. So I've downloaded those and there it is. There's the LC3 ROM. And now it's just a matter of programming these two EEPROMs to work in this machine. All right, so this is the interface up on the screen here for my Data IO 2900. Yes, it uses a terminal interface and I have a Wi-Fi serial device hooked up to it so I can access it from my machine without not without having to have it plugged in the serial port. Anyhow, I loaded the entire one megabyte ROM into memory on this thing. And here's the Mitsubishi 27400AK as the part that I'm gonna flash. And notice it says total set size is two. So I'm assuming that means it's gonna be two chips it's gonna make. I've never flashed anything like this before. Now I'm not totally sure how this works, but I'm assuming on the Macintosh here, the first chip, the low chip, has the first half of the ROM and the high chip has the second half. And then the other thing I may need to do is if, if I can't get this working, I have the two color classic ROMs here. I can read these out and compare them to the files I have on my disk that I downloaded from the same archive to see how these two ROM chips are split up. All right, so of the two chips, let's put the first one into the programmer, close that down. And simply all I have to do on here is hit enter. Now the chip is in there and uh oh, illegal bit error. <laughs> so I think that chip may not be good. Dear, oh dear, let's uh, push F3 here. I'm gonna do a quick blank check on this thing see what's going on. Execute. Non-blank device. Okay, well that might be the problem. I think I've programmed some of these before and I guess I didn't erase this one. I have a little EEPROM eraser here. So while I program the other one, I'm just gonna stick this in here and erase this chip. This thing is pretty cool. It has a little timer on it. It's very small and perfect. All right, and I have a different chip in here. Let's do blank chip on this, blank check on this one. I think this one's gonna work. So this little spinny thing here, operation complete, that means that is blank, that's perfect. So let's go back to program device, program device. All right, next device one of two. So we're gonna hit enter, here we go. All right, operation complete, partial set checksum, and there it is, uh, I should have set set auto increments, but I think what I do is I go down to here and I push two on there. And I think that is going to do the next one. Yes, it is. Next operation begins at, at 8,000. And I put another chip in there and I hit enter to program and I think it's programming. And there we go, it programmed the second chip. So I guess maybe this should work, perhaps. Now all I can do is test. All right, so the first set of ROMs I made did not work 
But on the other hand, I'm actually comparing the two color classic ROM. So these two screenshots here, when I loaded that in, and I'm comparing it to the file that I have on my downloaded hard drive. This one on the left is the low, and this one is the high chip. And this file here is a combination of both, makes it one megabyte. And it definitely looks like the way it works is it goes two bytes in the file are from the high chip, then two bytes in the low, two bytes in the high and low and so on. I think this is something I can handle in the EEPROM programmer itself. I just need to tell it that the data file I'm loading is 32 bits and the chips themselves are obviously 16 bits and it knows that. So I'm hoping that it's gonna do this splitting for me. Otherwise I'm gonna have to somehow write some kind of a script that does this 16 bits in one file, 16 bits in the other file, back and forth, back and forth, and makes two files that are 512K each. But I think I can get away with doing this without having to do that split myself. All right, I'm currently programming the second batch of chips. The difference is the data word width I've changed to 32. And according to the help file for the data IO, it says that this should actually be set to the data bus width in the target machine. So it knows that these chips, the 27400s, are 16 bits wide, and it now knows I'm putting this in a 32-bit computer. So it should be doing the byte split automatically. Now, if I set next device to two, it changes the next operation begins at zero here to two, which coincides to the file here. So the first two bytes should be zero and one, and the next should be two and three. So that should do the trick. I'm thinking this is gonna work here. And I'm just gonna do the programming and let's find out. All right, both chips have been programmed. So I'm gonna insert them in here. I'm not completely sure on which direction they should go in. Like one should be in the, the low slot. I think the one should be in the high slot. That is my hunch. Not totally sure, so I'm gonna put um, the one chip closer to me, the two closer to the back of the machine. Oh, I found a floppy drive that, that is the right one for this machine, actually. This uses the later floppy drives, the kind of lower profile ones than the earlier machines, but a viewer had donated this one, and I noticed in a photo, I could see that it was this drive. It has a little black flap on the front, so the way I know it. So I've put this in here, and actually doesn't use a mounting bracket. You just put screws in the side, and that holds it in. So hopefully that works if I get this machine working. All right, let's give it a try. All right, the monitor is connected. It's on VJ input. Let's see what happens. I do have a hard drive connected to the power supply here because uh, ideally this large ATX power supply does need a little bit of load on the 12 volt. And I don't think this computer is probably not giving it that load. All right, well, we're not getting anything so far. I'm gonna try swapping those around. Again, I'm like completely operating blind here to see if this machine is running or not, right? So here we go. Let's turn this off and swap those chips around. Chips are swapped. Here we go again. And we seem to be still getting nothing. Now again, I'm very much operating blindly here, thinking I'm doing the ROMs correctly, but I don't even know if this motherboard works and probably ideally I should be doing this testing on something like the Color Classic motherboard, not this one, but the other one that has the bad sound just because I know that that board works. So I think I should probably flash some EEPROMs for the Color Classic, but using the methodology I was using, that I was just showing you, see if I can get this thing working so I can rule out that the EEPROM programming is a problem. So any kind of faults that exist on this motherboard, I can try to find those. But yeah, I think at this point, I've definitely done far more troubleshooting than I really have time to do on a mail call episode, and I need to move on to other items. So Ed, Thank you very much for sending in this machine. I'm gonna to have to do further troubleshooting in the future to try and get this power supply working and see if I can sort out this ROM issue, recap the motherboard and see what I can do. So yes, thank you very much again. And hopefully we'll see this machine at a future time. All right, well, we have a package here that comes from Poland, actually. I can't really read the name and my Polish reading skills are basically zero. I think it might be Simon. S-Z-Y-M-O-N. I've already cut the package, but there are some cool stamps on here that look like garlic, I guess. Garlic stamps, that's awesome. And what do we have in here? There is a matchbox, an actual matchbox. How neat, let's just slide this open. Inside is a chip. It looks like a SID chip. It's an 8580, which is the SID chip from the later 64C machines. Now it's really cool to have one of these SID chips because these are different than the SIDs that are on all the bread bin machines. So uh, yeah, let's uh, take a look at this on the bench and test it out. 
So the Commodore 64C with a shortboard. And if you can believe it, this is the only shortboard machine that I have. And out of all of the 64s that I've received over the years, no one has ever sent in a 64C with a shortboard. Now this particular 64C actually had a longboard in it when I got it. Uh, this is not the field found 64. This is another one that I did get locally, but it had a regular longboard motherboard, which is the same as what's in a bread bin for the most part, which is why I have 3D printed brackets here to hold the keyboard. These brackets were sent in by a viewer, so thank you very much. I can't remember your name. This was actually a PAL motherboard that I ordered from Europe originally, and I bought it off eBay. It was not terribly expensive, but I really wanted to have a short board so I could use 8580 SIDS, which is what this is right here. So when I got this, all the socketed chips were removed, so the VIC was removed, the SID, and the clock controller here. But luckily everything else on here was actually not socketed, like the vias and, and the CPU and stuff like that. So I was really pleased when I populated the crystal, and luckily I had an NTSC VIC-2 that works in the shortboard. The shortboard uses a different VIC-2 than the longboards in the bread bins. So I had one of those already, and I put the crystal in, I put this clock chip in here, and the thing fired up. I was really excited. Now the SID, I didn't have an 8580s, so I ended up buying this from AliExpress, and I did make a video about it. It's a little while ago, so people may not have seen that, so I will put a link in the description to that video, but I have a check mark on here because I thought that this chip worked well. And here is the chip that Simon sent over. So this is another 8580, and this is an R5. Now, the thing I'm gonna do now is I'll put the keyboard back in here. I'm gonna put the SID I got from AliExpress through some of its paces. When I first got this thing, I did some testing on the YouTube video that I put out. I don't think I really knew as much about testing SIDs as I do now. So I just wanna make sure that that SID is working properly and then I can compare this to the one that Simon sent in and see if it's good. Now, China never made any fake SID chips, right? Like if you're getting a SID and it works, it's a real Commodore part. Question is, is it could be damaged because it definitely is being pulled out of old Commodore equipment, salvaged out of 64s, for instance, and they aren't tested. They're, they're probably pulled out, you know, put and sold in the markets. They may or may not work. Like the people who are selling them probably don't have a good way to test them. And even if they do put it into a 64, they might run a quick test and oh, it makes sound, okay, it works. But that there's a lot more to a SID than that. For loading software, I'm gonna be using this cartridge here, which is a chameleon cartridge. Now, I will be talking about this more in the future. This was a mail call item, so you're seeing things a little bit out of order here because uh, I've already opened the mail call packages that I had under the tree, and this was something that was in there. So um, I'll get to that. But for now, I'm just gonna be using this because it's easy for me to load some of the software on this. Uh, for my just that SID testing, that's all. So ignore that I'm using this right now, but you know, you can see it. So it's, I can't really hide that. So for testing the SID, I'm gonna be using a couple things. I'm gonna be using the Donkey Kong Arcade song. That's the 8-bit dance party song that everyone knows pretty well. But I'm also gonna be using a couple songs that are from the SID Burners 7 test disc. And if you watched my Field Found 64 video, I put a link in the description for that. I used that disc for testing that machine because I actually didn't know a lot about 64s when I first tested that machine. I think it was a few years ago now. So now I am so used to the way all those songs sound, those three songs, essentially there's Ode to 64, Legends Intro, and the Donkey Kong Arcade song. Those three SID songs push the SID to its limit, and I'm also so used to them that I can detect any kind of issues with the SID chip just by listening to them. So luckily um, the Chameleon 64 here has a file browser and you can actually just play music directly in here. You don't have to load a SID player or anything. So I have a bunch of songs on, on here on the SD card and we can go straight to the Donkey Kong arcade song as our first test. Here we go. All 
I turned the volume down on that. So it sounds absolutely fine. It's a little slower than people are used to, and that's because this SID player detects that this is a PAL song. So it actually uses the CIA, the 6526 timer on the 64, to run it at 50 hertz. Even though this is an NTSC machine the way it's configured here, it's playing this song at 50 hertz speed. When I play the actual game, it plays at 60 hertz, so it sounds a little bit faster. This is closer to how the author of this song, uh, Linus here, Sasha, he wanted this song to play at this speed. So just as a side note, if you're wondering why it sounds slow, that's why. So it sounds totally fine other than the slowness. Perfect, I don't hear any issues whatsoever. This, this is the Sid from AliExpress that's in here. Sounds great. Next song is gonna be Legends Intro. I'll turn the volume back up on the speaker here and let's see how this one sounds. This is one of the songs from Sid Burner's Seven. All right, so this one, um, it sounds quite different than I'm used to. Now, on the, on the SID player here, it tells you if this song has encoded in it what type of SID it was written for. And this one, it doesn't say. It was written by Martin here. Um, SID says unknown. It does know it's a PAL song, so it's playing a little slower than I'm actually used to as well. But um, I'm used to hearing it on the 6581. And this song in particular really sounds different on the 6581 versus this chip, at least as far as I can tell. I only have this one sample so far, uh, obviously before trying this new chip. So um, I, I just, basically that that kind of, the, the beginning of this song, there's like a wave sound that kind of whoosh, comes in and out, sounds very different on this SID, but then also there's like a kind of like a drum beat sound. And on the 6581, that really sounds nice and like deep and like crashing sound. And on this, it just sort of sounded like a, it's just crappy sounding. Now these differences, this is not a fault. The 8580 that's in here does sound very different than the 6581 in some respects, especially with the filters. It's just a very different chip internally. So that's expected. I'm not saying that any of this is wrong. I just wanna make sure that the songs don't sound completely out of whack, like there's some fault. So there's one more I wanna do, and it's Ode to C64, which is the intro song from the Sid Burner's disc, if you just load Sid Burner 7, this is the very first song that plays. Let's hear how this sounds. Okay. This sounds terrible. Okay, I don't want to listen to any more of that. So it sounds horrible. It sounds really distorted and very screwed up. Now on the screen here, it was composed in 2003 and it does say that it was composed for a 6581. So this song may just not work properly on the 8550 that's in here. So I don't know if that's a fault necessarily, but it definitely sounds terrible. Now the thing is the Sid Burner 7 disc was put out you know, in the 2000s. And by then, obviously, a ton of people have these Commodore 64s. So I can't imagine the creators of that disc would have picked a title track that sounds like garbage when you're playing it on a 64C with a shortboard. That doesn't make sense to me. I can't imagine that this song was composed in a way that sounds only good on the 6581. It sounds horrible on this. I think at this point, I wanna swap chips and see if uh, it fixes the sound on this song and if Legend's intro sounds different. I have to say that the Donkey Kong song sounds exactly the same, I'm used to it. Like, there doesn't seem to be a difference between the, the two different models of the SID. So, 
let me power off this machine and let's just quickly swap over uh, this SID chip here. And I do got to say, what's really great about the 8580 is like this chip is just a little bit warm. Uh, of course, the regular SID would have been burning hot by now <laughs> in here. And that's just because I think it runs on 12 volts and this SID only runs on five or nine. I can't remember. On the original bread bin, the VIC and the SID both run on 12 volts and five volts. But on this one, one of them only runs on five and that's it. And the other one runs at nine volts and five. And I can't remember which does which. Maybe it's the SID that runs on nine volts and five, and it's the VIC that only runs on five volts. And that's really why you can't take these chips and pop them into a bread bin machine. It will damage them because they will be suddenly getting voltages that they do not expect. So I'm just checking to make sure these pins look good. All looks great from this chip that Simon sent in. It looks like it comes from 1991. And the AliExpress chip has a day code from 1987. Now, uh, this one says MOS on it in 87. This one says CSG, which is Commodore Semiconductor Group, I think that stands for. That seems legit. Uh, they did switch to CSG later on when they were doing like the Amigas. In fact, notice this other chip over here has an 89 day code and it says CSG on it. Actually, I just wanna try a quick test here. I have some acetone on this uh, cotton swab here and I wanna see if this writing comes off, if it's been rebadged fakery going on it would come right off but you know what look at that the cotton swab is completely clean the chip is not being affected at all by it so i don't think this has even been rebadged it was just a chip that was salvaged out of an old 64 and then sold on, on aliexpress all right one last check just make sure the notch is in the right position it is i don't want to potentially damage anything power this on All right, I'm gonna start with Legends intro again from SidBurner7. Let's see if this sounds any different. Interesting. All right, so that did sound different. The drum beat there sounded sort of high pitched, almost like someone was banging on a piece of sheet metal or something, or like a side of a tin shed, like a high pitched. It definitely sounds different than this China chip, but let's check out O to C64, which is the real bellwether test because this sounded like garbage on the other chip. Here we go. This sounds fine. Wow. Okay, I don't need to listen to any more to know that this chip, that this song is playing back completely fine on this chip. So this one I got from AliExpress is actually damaged. Wow. I'll play a little bit of how it sounded on this, the AliExpress chip here, just so you can hear the difference. So I am quite surprised that this 8580 that I got from AliExpress is actually damaged. The difference between how these chips play O to C64 is shocking. And this one, the new one from Simon sounds perfect. I mean, it still sounds different than it does on the 6581. And I think I prefer the 6581, but that's probably because I'm just used to that, the way it sounds. It sounds a little more fuller, a little more bassy than these chips. 
but um, this, this one from AliExpress sounds terrible. But then it's weird how in other songs, sounds absolutely perfect and without any noticeable problems. Let me boot up the Easy Flash 3. I haven't transferred everything onto this um, Chameleon yet, so this has still useful tools on it. Like Adrian's tools here, and let's go to SidBencher and run this full SID test analysis on the SID that seems to be not working. See if I hear any problems in here. So this section here, it's testing the filters. And what I need to do is listen to this on the new chip and sound, see how these sound. If it's different, maybe this is where the fault is appearing. I mean, I wouldn't, I don't think anything sounds wrong right here listening to this section, but I need to compare to another known good, 8580, to see if there actually is an issue. No. So. This filter testing here does sound a little different, but it doesn't sound dramatically different. It's not different enough. Sorry, turn the volume down. It's not different enough that I would have thought that the original chip has a fault. They do sound different though, but I suppose the different songs manifest it differently. Well, I guess there we have it. So my AliExpress SID is actually bad and uh, Simon's seems to work great. And I'm actually really glad to have it because uh, I never knew that there was a problem with this one, but now I have a nice working SID chip in my only shortboard 64. So thank you very much, Simon, for sending in this cool little matchbox with a nice little surprise of a working SID in there. I really appreciate it. Well, that is gonna be it for this mail call video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, I would appreciate a thumbs up, but if you didn't, you know what to do. And of course, hit that subscribe button to subscribe to my channel and hit the bell icon for notifications. Although I do have to say that I myself have clicked on the notification bell for other people's channels. I have not seen a single notification on my phone coming from the YouTube app for new videos in what might be months. I honestly don't think that feature works at all. But I still do ask you click it because apparently it helps channels and engagement. So anyhow, uh, put your comments, your suggestions in the comment section below. That's going to be it. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.